for those of you who don't know, I'm Ashley. This is Paul. We're married. We live in Fresno. And Paul talks about religion and politics and all kinds of provocative things to, I'm going to just say millions of people around the world. <laughs> <laughs> if you consider the haters who repeatedly tag you, you have received posts from millions of people or millions of posts, let's say. So. We're going to talk Jesus revolution and revival tonight. It just brought up so many nostalgic, mostly beautiful, some painful just moments and threads from our faith history as a family, as individuals, and as a couple. And uh, we have lots to talk about. And I feel like tonight, if you are a Gen Xer, and if you had any exposure to the Jesus People movement, like if your parents were influenced by that, and so therefore it made an impact on you, we're going to hang out tonight and just reconnect around some really, I think, important and powerful themes that came from the movie. Yeah. And we were a little bit hesitant to go see the movie, yeah. have to be honest, because I hate Christian movies, just as a rule. Yeah. If it's a Christian movie that any church would say, let's get hot, let's show Hollywood how we like family right. entertainment, go yeah, watch like, this movie. Let's that all... means the movie's going to suck yeah. brutally. If the second that somebody suggests there be like a group purchase of tickets by a church <laughs> to go see a movie for the life. I've been knowing Paul for 28 years now, 29, if you count, yeah. like before we were married, he breaks out into hives. He gets hostile. He starts sweating and like profusely cursing. He hates movies that are like Christian genre. I hate bad movies in general. Which means you hate Christian movies because Christian, they're almost all bad. Christian well, movie and bad movie are yes, an oxymoron. Kind of they, one and the same. Yeah, they're the same thing. And by the way, art, just because from a Christian point of view, like it doesn't have to be terrible. You know what I mean? Like you can do like good art, you well, should, the, no matter what. The best Christian story I've ever read or seen in my life is Les Miserables. That's, oh my God, don't get me started. Yeah. So you started by saying... We were a little anxious about going to see the movie because we just didn't know if it would be a quality like storytelling or not. And we love storytelling. And I think we were concerned that it was going to be told from a very thin, staunch perspective. And we weren't completely wrong about that. Maybe yes. do we need to describe the movie. My heart leapt when I heard that this movie was about Lonnie Frisbee because my family, my my parents were really impacted by John Wimber and the vineyard movement. And so I heard on cassette tapes back when I was like junior high kid. <laughs> yes, we're that old. Yeah. Like so many cool stories about Lonnie Frisbee. And then we had watched the documentary about him and just he, his life and his pursuit of this radical transforming, no details, love, just pure love from God. And that love is transforming is probably the most influential part of my faith journey and Keith Green was all up in that. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. So talk yeah. a little bit about what is the story that's being don't maybe no spoiler alerts, although it is history. So like people yeah. know the story. So Jesus Revolution is about basically about the Jesus people movement of the 70s. It was a time when many hippies, if we can use that term, got got saved, be turned to Christianity as a part of their movement. And this is told about that time in history from a perspective of a pastor named Chuck Smith, who many may know in our audience that Chuck Smith ultimately was a megachurch pastor of a what are you a network of churches called Calvary Chapel. And many of you may know the Calvary Chapel. And Chuck Smith was pastoring a small assemblies of God church when this guy named this hippie named Lonnie Frisbee walked into his life. You won't see this in the movie, but Lonnie became a Christian, had a salvation experience dancing naked on top of a mountain in Southern California, high on LSD. And he was a guy that could pray for people and things would happen. They would fall down. Some would say they were healed. And so he started this hippie movement in Chuck Smith's church. And we see that in the movie. The movie is about another Calvary Chapel megachurch pastor named Greg Laurie, who is not one of my favorites. And you don't really hear the whole story of Lonnie Frisbee, but it's how Lonnie Frisbee's sort of impetus of starting this movie led to this move of God, so to speak, a revival that went national and international. Lonnie Frisbee eventually leaves the church in the movie and in real life. And I don't know, that's not a spoiler alert necessarily, but that's what the movie is about. Yeah. Kelsey Grammer, by the way, of 
Kramer, or not Kramer, oh. Frazier. Cheers before that. <laughs> Cheers, Cheers or, is your yeah. fame. Yeah. Is uh, plays Chuck Smith. Yeah. Yeah. So it so I think probably the, the right way to think about Jesus, the Jesus revolution is that it is it is definitely the story of Greg and Kathy Lo- Kathy Laurie's trajectory. And that is interesting and special and cool. It is partially, it seems like, the story of Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel, and then an even smaller portion of the story about Lonnie Frisbee. And so it's these three threads being woven together. I personally am very consumed and interested in the life of Lonnie Frisbee, so I went for that reason. And also just to try to connect again with that feeling of just reckless abandonment for the pursuit of this big, audacious, loving God. And I don't think I encountered that in the movie, but it brought back a lot of memories. And then, and then it, yeah, we, we went home last night and we watched the documentary about Lonnie Frisbee called Frisbee. The, was it the hippie, the hippie the, preacher? The life and death of, of a hippie, hippie preacher. preacher. And that's on Prime. I think it's on YouTube as well. So you can watch that. We would strongly recommend if you, yeah. if you watch the movie, then watch the documentary yeah. about yep. Lonnie. So you yep. can get the full story. Yeah. So they, they don't treat Lonnie very well. They don't mention in the movie that that Lonnie was probably queer, had a little bit different sexuality. The churches, he was involved in Calvary Chapel in the movie. He did eventually move over to the Vineyard Association of Churches and all the time was made accountable to keep track of this sexuality issue in his life issue Yeah, and, and was greatly shamed for it. Ultimately, it led to his demise and he did pass away of AIDS in the early 90s. Yeah. So for all of those reasons, just it prompted us to go kind of go back and dig up these stories. It kept rippling. But the, the outgrowth of it into the Vineyard Movement and what is called the Vineyard Association of Churches, a chain of churches internationally that that began in Southern California, greatly impacted our lives. And, for sure. And we 100%. were wanting revival to come. And it's also pertinent as we had this Asbury, Kentucky thing going on or Ashbury. And we've just been thinking, okay, we were hungry for revival. And we thought revival meant we'll have a bunch of church services with loud music seven nights a week for an elongated period of time. And then we got to a place of, but if that leads to what we see in Christianity today, then maybe there's not quite as much value in that type of revival as we'd hoped. Yeah. Also, though, you and I had determined long ago that we were not interested in church services as the measure of a move of God. That is a fact. And so don't take us backwards from there. Well, because we thought having church services seven nights a week with loud music and people falling on the floor and stuff would mean they would get up off the floor and go change the world for the better. Yeah. We, We didn't realize that led to Christian nationalism and trying to overthrow the country. But that's a whole yeah. another and that's so painful. But we thought <laughs> that yeah, we thought because our heart in looking for revival was that the measurables of poverty and economic struggle and economic inequality and racial inequality in our city would be changed. When we see what we saw in the movie and consider that era in history and the heart sentiment, the expression, the hunger, the desire that people had for things to be different and to connect with an authentic expression of love. Imagine, again, we're too young to have known this ourselves directly, but the hippie movement in general, like that in and of itself blows my mind when I think about the power of that movement and the clash that we were, that society was seeing and well, American society was seeing, and I guess more around the world too, like every single day in this whole big showdown between the squares and the hippies, like that in and of itself, I feel like in the church world, we only grab onto and then the druggies be wanted to know Jesus. And so then they became Jesus people or Jesus freaks. But listen, that heart they became ex- Christian. They became Christian. But when they were on drugs and when they were saying what they were saying and trying to find connection in the way they were, I believe that too was of God. Yeah. It yeah. didn't just start when people started saying a prayer and getting baptized. The whole expression of culture and society at that time that things need to be that they need to be different, that we've got to connect and see each other differently, not go to war, all that kind of stuff. 
also of God, Ashley thinks. Yeah, I agree. And even in just the story of Lonnie, which again was whitewashed by this Greg Laurie financed movie of Calvary Chapel that Lonnie Frisbee had his conversion experience to Christianity, said he was visited by Jesus while dancing naked on a mountain high on LSD, and that he was right at the center, if not the prophet that brought a move of God, so to speak, while being shamed for his queerness. And I, and that is an uncomfortable truth yeah. for Calvary Chapel and Vineyard to deal with, that the blessing of heaven Fell would come through on, this guy. Yes. Like, we can just focus on that for a second, and we can move to like the 90s and kind of the way we were thinking about transformational love at that point forward. But let's just, this to me is the big center of the target for this moment in watching this movie is just a big old heart check on, oh my God, I was so grieved just watching this yesterday and considering like how I wish things had been different back then. And how I wish it was the case that people did not assign this shame and judgment to somebody who was queer, was not, not, who knows what, but like maybe a bunch of different things. And just the shame that he probably lived out his last days in is absolutely, I don't know, it just grieves my heart. The problem with Christianity is that something good can only happen if you are saved, and saved means to say a sinner's prayer and start going to church, a Christian church, and then you function inside of the Christian church. And rather than human beings are beautiful as they are, and that presence of a spirit that is divine can come through the most unlikely of characters. That's it. And they would say flawed, But what if we say not flawed? What What if if we just say human? What if not flawed? And what if God doesn't hate queer people? It's just so silly to me. And what if God is, and I don't think of God as a person, but I'm talking about God in evangelical terms because that's where we came from. And, you know, what if God is pleased for something divine to happen through a Muslim? What if God is pleased for something divine to happen through an atheist? What if God is pleased through a Samaritan, as we see through the story of Jesus? And Christianity has to suck everything into its own vortex. Only We are the only ones with truth. And we see this in the movie that Chuck Smith is saying to Lonnie, we need to control this. We need to manage it. And they don't say it in the movie, but because we will lose money if we don't. We will lose attendance if we don't. And it's very sad, but maybe it's just a natural thing of human institution. Once we try to incorporate something into the institution of whatever, and particularly the church in the religious space, we're going to manhandle it in a way and make it human. And anything that's outside of that human norm is going to get despised. I mean, I think... What I wish I knew, and there's a lot of questions and things to scroll through and in here in just a second, and we'll get to some of your questions yeah, a and lot comments, of questions but, coming um, in, but yeah. I think if I could go back to, I don't know, I don't, whatever, if I could rewind history and like implant two major ideas into these late sixties, early seventies and forward, they would be, first of all, what if Lonnie Frisbee was not flawed, a sinner, a hypocrite, a what if there was love and healing and space for him to be whoever he was? Yeah. Okay. Number one. Number two, what if these people who obviously are committed to love their pastors, they're like making sacrifices in their lives to care for other people. That is beautiful and wonderful. And what if they knew that the move of God and the things of God are not just about an institution, are not just about being captured and shaped and channeled into what we've experienced in the traditional evangelical Western church. Like what, like you can hang on to and say, oh yeah, but I still really like my evangelical church. Great. Just don't limit your thinking to believe that God only speaks slash work slash moves through those channels. Because honestly, wherever people are showing up, seeing each other, loving each other, being like available to sacrifice themselves for one another, like that's God to me. Yeah, that's be- like maybe if the church could be like, hey, we're going to stop being afraid of everyone hating us. And oh my God, we're going to go away. We're going to be okay with being small. We're going to be okay with just being who we are. 
valuing what we do. And also we're going to value other expressions of God and love and mm. count it all a blessing, all of it. I watched an interview with Greg Laurie on YouTube I don't this morning. He was just in the, oh, what a, how sad that Lonnie didn't fulfill his potential, which is what Chuck Smith said at his fucking funeral, right. by the way, right. which if you watch the documentary, it'll make you sick to see what this white old pastor said about this amazing beaten up young man. What if, exactly as you said, what if he, Lonnie had been accepted just as he was by Greg Laurie and Chuck Smith and wouldn't have been shamed and chased away and ended as a tragic story. Problem is the church can never be introspective about that stuff. Yeah. Greg Laurie has no ability to say, yeah. I had something to do with Lonnie Frisbee's demise. My religion was majorly in the middle of Lonnie Frisbee died of AIDS and we need to repent of that yep. and repent publicly. Yeah. By the way, as Andy Stanley is starting to do in Atlanta and say, we need to repent publicly of the hundreds and thousands of queer people that we've chased away. And many of them we have caused to die yeah. because of our very bad theology. And like, how about just being like, man, we don't have it all figured out. Yeah. We don't have it all figured out. And we want to walk in surrender and in love. And we want to be open to people contributing their best, contributing their sacrificial love. And that's community. That's society. We will build society on that commitment to one another. How about that? And so we have this college in Kentucky that has a worship service, a chapel service like Christian schools do, and something happens. And I'm not even going to question whether it's divinely inspired or not. I think there's something supernatural out there. I don't believe in God as a being on a throne with two eyes, two ears, and a nose, but I know there's something bigger than the universe, something supernatural out there. I don't believe in God as a being on a throne with two eyes, two ears, and a nose, but I know there's something bigger than the universe and it could be in here. It could be out there. I really don't or care both, to argue, both. Argue, or I both. Mean, something happened and they got excited and they continued to have church for days and days and days. And I love that. Again, that was in our heart to see happen. Yeah. But again, if the city of Ashbury or Asbury, I can't remember the name of it, and the state of Kentucky doesn't repent that they haven't taken care of the poor, the foreigner, the marginalized and the widow, which represents the economically disadvantaged, those who don't have access to the economic system, then it's pointless. It's just human entertainment. But if people get up off the deck and say, I am transformed and now I'm going to go transform the world around me, I'm going to follow the 2000 commands of the Bible. That say take care, not just take care of. It's not a backpack drive. It's not a fundraiser. It's not handing out a buck on the corner, although there's nothing wrong with any of those. It is seeking justice, the Bible says, for the poor, the foreigner, the marginalized, the LGBTQ+, the Muslim, the people who are otherized, the trans people, for God's sakes, right now in our culture, those that are otherized and the economically disadvantaged, those are the ones you have to stand for. I would like to interject. 
Are you saying you are also otherized no. as a woman? No, I'm and not saying women that. And I'm women. not saying that, actually. Um, I'm saying I'm, I'm raising my hand to interject. So in the Kentucky thing, you know what I thought was so inspiring was just hearing that the students were given the opportunity to wrap up that service that first night. And they're like, no, we're not leaving. And what I hear in that is I hear a heart of I will sacrifice something to stay here and seek and pursue this connection with the supernatural and with love. And I think it's that sacrifice that is what draws the attraction and the attention of God. So I just thought that was the moment where it's, oh, boom, this could be a cool thing. And then the thing about, okay, I understand where you're coming from on pointing to the importance of getting up off the floor and being different. But I also feel like the way you frame that, it it almost makes it sound formulaic. It almost turns it into a works thing where you're like, oh, now I have to go volunteer on this issue or that issue. I just think it's always a heart positioning first. And it could be that your change in your heart is not necessarily about, and now I'm going to go campaign on a social justice issue. It's It could be something very different for an individual. Do you know what I mean? And I don't want to just make it like God connection isn't real unless you go do a social justice thing after. Is that fair to say? I It's fair to say. And I think there probably is nuance in that. I still believe salvation sozo in the Bible is demonstrated through taking care of the least. Because what some people will say is, oh, I went to a revival and then I went and built a church in Bolivia and came back and nothing else changed. That's not seeking justice for the poor, the foreigner, the marginalized, and the economically disadvantaged. I really do believe the Bible is saying, we see all through the history of the Bible, the history of the world is when the church, people who claim to be following God, forget those commands culture and their religion comes to an end. And I don't know, how is it not pointed towards something aimed in that direction? No, that's an interesting point. I just, I don't know, maybe we should do another conversation about that. Because yeah, this sure. is something that... Like Tim says here in on Facebook, or they get up off the deck and acknowledge fully that Black Americans are economically behind still from slavery. Maybe it is like you get up and you're like, I was opposed to CRT being in high schools when CRT is not in high schools because I was told that on right-wing media. I'm going to go really search and see if that's true and see if maybe my heart has been placed in the wrong space or something like that. I just think there has to be a heart change that then moves itself into some action. And I'm not talking about I, work I'm not, but you should just, be moved to action. I'm not disagreeing it. with that at all. I think that's right. I think what I'm saying is you are defining a certain set of actions that are the only acceptable actions and evidence of that heart change. And I think that is limiting. And, and you I know where you have, I got that list of things I know from? you're going to say the Bible. The Bible. Yes, I am going to say but, the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but Again, also, only about 2,000 times it commands it. Okay, I guess maybe what I'm reacting to is that there's a certain understanding of these are the activities that the Bible is pointing to, and I want to interrogate that. I, okay. I, I think that you have to keep your heart soft towards what is the thing. I don't, I just am a little hesitant to lock in on it. It's just this sort of judgy, it's only this. I think those four categories give you a wide swath of things you could do. Seeking justice for the poor, the foreigner, the marginalized, and the economically disadvantaged. Let's. There's a whole lot of how, shit you can do. That's a whole lot of shit. Out. How about this, Pastor Paul? How about you do some Bible talks and un, like really get into that language and let's get some fresh inspiration into that language, okay? Okay. I think that would be... And what you're saying is right. It is letting your heart be softened. It is our history of being sat down by our friends from the colors of community in our town and letting them say to us, you guys have white privilege and you need to know what you don't know. And we're like, what? No, we're good. We're a church that is accepting of queer people. Yeah, but you won't officiate one of their weddings. So let us tell you where you're falling short. And hearing that and saying, okay, that hurts. I don't agree. I feel like I'm a good person. But if I need to hear this, I want to hear this. And maybe that's part of it. No, I think that is a lot of, of what I'm trying to say is just think that in this day and age, I get a little tired of the judgment and the harshness of this is the only thing or this is the only thing. So I and I also am trying to balance out your persona a little bit because I'm not saying you're not. 
<laughs> right to be like <laughs> pounding the table on this, but I'm also like, okay, and let's unpack this some more because an example, like what what would be an example that would be different than what I'm talking? Well, about? I think it's like in again, if the focus is on your heart being soft and your heart being in surrender and not thinking that you perfectly know everything, and and just being open and accepting, hey, God can God and love, perfect love can show up in all kinds of different ways. I'm not the author of exactly this is God, this isn't. And I want to submit to, I want to submit to this powerful love. And let's say this powerful love, like you're moved in the worship service in Kentucky and you get up off the floor and you're moved to reconciliation with a family member that you had shut out of your life. Now, that's not a social justice campaign. That's not going to the front of the picket line, but that might be in your heart. That might be the, like moving the thing out of the way that you would never do, but your heart got soft because you encountered love. So like when you just jump to these, not well, when you point to the scripture that says it's got to be these four things, I'm just saying scripture, I'm just saying make room for people to live and walk this out and also corporately. So there's the individual and there's the corporate in corporately and collectively as our hearts are softened and we are standing in surrender and in pursuit of perfect love, should we be collectively saying, and this is right and this is wrong and we need to be moving society in different direction? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I agree with you on that. I don't know how to say it any other way than Jesus said, if you don't clothe the naked, you don't visit the prisoner in prison, you don't take care, feed the hungry, He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't know what else to say other than that. And yes, reconciliation with a family member is beautiful. I'm a teacher of the Bible. And Jesus said, anybody would lay down their life for a friend, but to prove you're a follower of me and of God, a true follower is you lay down your life for an enemy. Could you have a really hard heart towards the fresh, the freshness of a perfect love and God. Could you have a really hard heart towards God and volunteer on a weekend on a prison outreach? Oh, no question. Christians love prison outreach. And again, prison outreach is about bringing people into Christianity. It's not about meeting the needs. Okay. So agendaless love. Let's put that out there. Agendaless love. By the way, thanks everybody for the gifts you're sending on TikTok. Don't forget You can go to our website, pastor-paul.com. Don't forget the dash. The dash is really important. Pastor-paul.com and subscribe. And we would just love for you to subscribe to our Pastor Paul community for as little as $5.99 a month. You help us do free shit like this. And if you have more to give, you can subscribe up to $100 a month, get a monthly one-on-one meeting with me, and we get to hang out together and do fun stuff pastor-paul.com. Do me a favor, go check it out. That's how I earn my keep as I do this. And by the way, as a person who's been living with Paul for the last 28, 29 years, we can never remember how long. And as a person who like every single day I get to come home from work and be like, okay, this is this crappy thing happened. This is the conflict I feel in my heart and get to talk it through with him. He's like a freaking emotional chiropractor. And like this, like one-on-one, like doing a monthly one-on-one with Paul is actually like a tremendous value. Check it out, support. There's a lot of ways to support and you will definitely be benefited from it. I'm seeing the comments, someone saying that you grew your hair out. So let's pause for a moment and say we both have frizzy hair now. I know it's supposed to be a little more I, curly. See, I than really, I like it. I Do think you? it looks so good, I think especially it looks like the Brady Bunch afros at the end of the Brady look, Bunch. Look, you're due for a trim, but generally <laughs> speaking, I really think it looks nice. Ooh, 1946, the movie is with us on TikTok. Our friends, we Rocky love, and Jenna. love, love that movie, and can't wait for it to get distributed really broadly. So many people, we want to do a, a viewing in Fresno. There's yeah. like a ton of people who want to see it here. Yeah. By the way, this is cool though because I'm now getting. And we always had people comment about your hair on our lives together. Now I'm getting comments on my I know. Hair I'm I feeling it. a little insecure. I just did hot <laughs> yoga, by the way. So that's why I had to come home and let my hair yoga. be frizzy and also drink my electrolyte water. So it was intense. If you have questions, let us know. I know somebody had asked before about the vineyard writing Lonnie out of their history. And I think the answer to that is yes. Now we have friends or at least 
former friends in the vineyard who would disagree with that, that happened. But yes, for the most part, both Calvary Chapel and Vineyard have been scrubbed of Lonnie's effect on their history. Yeah. And or so you know. Calvary Chapel, would you say? And like last night we were watching as we watched the Frisbee Life and Death of a Hippie Pastor documentary, which is super cool. You can check it out on YouTube in Prime. The the Vineyard co-founders, Ken Gullickson, I think yeah. Ken, and then of course John, John Wimber, who's passed, but Ken was on that documentary and his thing, I feel like they credit Lonnie more with the outbreak of the spirit, but they definitely talk about how he was flawed and he was he just they often point to the pain of his childhood and they yeah. I think express some grace, but it's in the form of he lost his way, he, whatever. And yeah, we're regretting that is the way people think about oh. the story of Lonnie's impact on the vineyard. And as we understand it, it was basically a Chuck Smith saying, hey, how do I get this guy out of here so he doesn't hurt my ministry and the money that's coming in now? And so he's go over to see these vineyard guys. They're a little more like you. And so he comes to preach in John Wimber's church in Yorba Linda, California on Mother's Day. 1980? Was it 80? Somebody, yeah, I think somebody so. would, because it was 72 when Lonnie, I think if I remember the movie right, left Calvary Chapel. And I think it was 1980. Okay. Um, with the Mother's the, Day thing? Yeah. And, and so on Mother's Day, the story is pretty incredible. If you ever check it out, it, Lonnie basically says what everybody under the age of 25 come to the front of the church. And it was a fairly large church at the time. And so all these 25 and unders come forward and basically, the story is Lonnie Frisbee just says, I see the Holy Spirit on this group of people right here. And as he puts out his hand, like everybody falls down and like all the younger people in the front fall down and the people sitting in the pews or chairs behind him, they fall down and he just starts pointing. And af after a while, like everybody's falling over and one of the like worship people falls over on a microphone and is like, Speaking, speaking in, in tongues. tongues through the <laughs> microphone and the 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 sound guy has hit the deck and so there's nobody to control what's happening on the sound and it and a bunch of people left the church because it of sounds it. like it got pretty intense and but it did spark something of happening and and the vineyard is still alive today uh We've gone a little more right wing now, but well, yeah. okay. So yeah, we've lost touch with with the vineyard. But in my spiritual DNA and background, what I observed and experienced through my parents were in the eighties. My dad was a student of John Wimber's at Fuller Seminary, and so he, my dad was like bringing home the cassette tapes and. We were Southern Baptists at the time. So it was like, oh my God, this radical stuff is happening. And <laughs> it and, was contraband in your house. Yeah, in our church it was. But my both my mom and my dad were just so excited about like it's real. Oh, it's real. And I felt that as a kid. Oh, there's th there is this authentic, <coughs> pardon me, authentic love and move of God. And like we just wanted to be a part of it. That ideal was really represented by the early days of the vineyard, I'd say. And it truly was, I think, through John Wimber and his wife Carol, and we knew his daughter his daughter-in-law, Christy. They were like, let's forget about the rules. They were willing to risk. Let's forget about you know? all and let's just say there's something out there in, in the ethos. And yeah. so I would say this, and many of our followers and listeners are deconstructionists, many who have left their evangelical church. And for some, it's been such a painful experience. You can't listen to the music anymore. Some tell me they can't even read the Bible anymore. And that is all completely underst understandable. But I ended up two weeks ago listening to a very old Vineyard song, and then so did you. Okay, and shall we say the name for those of you? Look at us. Hey. Yeah, on TikTok, we hey. got sunglasses going. Um, Megwitch Itchy Manitou. Does anybody Me Meg know? Megwitch Gitchy Manitou. It's probably a total appropriation of indigenous it's heritage. It probably is. I, uh, but also, like, we had major God encounters. Yeah. With, uh, yeah. And so I guess I'm saying this. I don't want the bastards to be able to steal something from me that is amazing. And I do believe we are connected to something internal and external, perhaps, as you said, that is divine and supernatural, that's bigger than the human experience. And I'm willing to stipulate it may all be inside of me and made up by my parts inside of here. And I'm okay with that because it's still a really cool experience. And so I want to be able to say, okay, something happened in these church services. It just dies and gets flawed when it starts being tried 
to brought into the institution of the church and the religion of Christianity. When we say you can access this through whatever is drawing you to your better yeah. self and to true agendaless love, then we will bless it. We will bless it. And so if it is Christian kids at a Christian school in Kentucky or our, some of our indigenous friends who use Peyote. psychedelics yeah. as a part of their spiritual worship, or we're going to say yes to that or are affirming and accepting churches that have gay pastors. And in Acts, there was this whole argument of, do you have to be a Jew to be a Christian? Like they believed you had to have been circumcised and done all the ceremonial things of being Jewish to be able to be a Christian. And the leaders of it all got together and said, I don't know what to tell you. I understand what the Bible says, but look, the spirit of God is on these people. So we're going to have to accept them in. And why can't we do the same today and say, if it's drawing you to your better self, we're for it. Hey, by the way, someone thinks that our dog is a cat. No. <laughs> he, uh -oh. If he were a human, he'd be so offended. He's a dog. But it's a Wil Wilford Brimley mustache. That's hilarious. I know. Yeah, he's a white. He, his face is getting ever whiter. Yeah, he's he kind of old. Older. He's an old man. Okay, so we, it is, what time is it here? It's 7.01 on the West Coast. We started about 6.15. How long do you think we should keep up this chat? Well, we've, we've got a good group of people going. So I was going to ask Facebook user, somebody who didn't put their name in there, says Lonnie was the main guy in the Jesus movement. I'm wanting to go see that one. In your opinion, is it worth $5 to see? Is the movie worth it to go see? I think our recommendation is see that movie. Yes. And then also we rented last night. I think it was $1.99 on Prime. See the documentary. Eventually we watched it on YouTube though, didn't we? Or did we watch I it think on I found it on YouTube and then, but then I didn't think it was the right thing. And so I, we found it on Prime for $1.99. So I think you should watch both. Yeah. I think you should. And the documentary is called Frisbee. Frisbee. The end F. of a hippie preacher. Yeah. Very good documentary. Yeah. So yeah, watch both. I, I The movie wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It's just yeah. with our sort of insight into what the history is, we yeah. can see that the history was scrubbed to give a more fundamentalist evangelical view of what happened. But I think, but I, so I feel like just pay attention to what comes up for you as you're watching it. So uh, it was worth it for me because there were some really just like wonderful like reflections and connections to like our faith history. It made me really sad to think about why things ended the way they did with Lonnie and to like just be in prayer and like asking God, can that please be changed? Like we don't, we wouldn't want to re repeat that mistake in our generation. And I believe it didn't happen. Sorry to interrupt, but it, I didn't, I don't believe it happened because Lonnie was flawed and falling away. I think it happened because Lonnie was hurt, like a lot of human beings are, and got rejected again by his fathers right. in the church. Right. And the church, instead of being accepting and loving and saying, you're amazing, said, you don't fit our grid. And unless you can change, we won't have you. And eventually used him, used his gifts to build their churches, and then threw him by the wayside. That's and, right. And the church needs particularly Calvary chapels and probably vineyards need to hold themselves responsible yeah. to that. There's another aspect of the story that's not included in the movie. So Chuck Smith, his daughter is prominent in the movie, but he also has a son who was not oh, right. referenced at all in the movie. So I think it just, it's, so it's bottom line is this. Yeah. See the movie and also learn about all the aspects of the Jesus people movement. That's what it, brought up for me. And that was worth it. For and sure. uh, yeah, Chuck Smith Jr. has been an outspoken critic of his father for many years in Calvary Chapel. And so in the movie, you would never guess that the Smiths had a son. Also, by the way, a junior, we will soon all be able to watch 1946, the movie. Yeah. And that is going to be a really important companion piece to yeah. these movies and documentaries we're talking about now. J.H. says on YouTube, Lonnie was a homosexual, which goes against God's will. And so on two points, I would disagree with what you're saying and what you're meaning there. I watched 1946, the movie, when it comes out, homosexual was never a word included in the Bible until 1946. And those passages are not talking about consenting 
same gender couples. It is talking about a power differential in sexuality. It's talking about somebody using another person for their sexuality and their sexual pleasure. And by the way, just read Romans 1. The sin of Romans 1 is not homosexuality. It's pagan temple worship. I wish people would think for a moment. And then the second thing I would say is there are a whole bunch of other activities and human actions listed in Romans 1, in 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy 1 that Christians never treat the way you treat gay people. It is the height of hypocrisy to use Leviticus or those clobber passages to condemn gay people if you're not willing to do the same to somebody who cheats on their taxes, who are a gossiper, or or you're Isn't following like gluttony, all one gluttony. Of them? Yeah. And if you're and if you're not following all the Levitical laws, you cannot cherry pick the Levitical laws and say, God hates these people, but I'm going to ignore yeah. all these other ones for myself. Can I talk about gluttony for a minute? Sure. So I had a very gluttonous weekend <laughs> on Friday night. I was like, I'm having sushi and I'm going to have all I can eat and my favorite cold stone ice cream. And then last night we had Indian food. <laughs> and I face planted in that stuff. Man, oh man, talk about gluttony. Indian food's not my favorite. No, but oh, it's so good. And it by is. Indian food, we're talking about from India, not inappropriately using indigenous. I think that people terms. know that. Okay, good. Yeah. So Peg says, I wasn't raised evangelical. I joined in my mid 20s. I'm deconstructing. JH says, Genesis 2 is the nail in the coffin for homosexuality, which is. So completely not true. The Genesis, the two different creation stories we have in Genesis, a completely different story in Genesis 1 than in Genesis 2. And the story from Genesis 2 was likely taken from mythology of some of the peoples around the Hebrews at the time. And what it says literally is, let's make man in our image. And it says, God made man in his image, male and female. He made them. And I was actually just watching a rabbi testify in front of the legislature in Missouri today. And he says that Jewish history has always had multiple genders. He says you can read in ancient Jewish text that there were six genders in ancient Hebrew culture. Nowhere in the Hebrew scripture that Christians appropriate as the Old Testament does it forbid lesbian sex. So you cannot say the Levitical passages or Genesis 2 ban all same gender sex and same gender in intimacy. You are cherry picking the Bible to do that and totally misunderstanding the purpose of those laws. And I keep encouraging Christians to think about the fact that you're taking Hebrew sacred text and you're saying they mean this when our Jewish friends say they absolutely do not mean that. What gives Christians the right to say, we get to take your scriptures, Jewish people, and make them our own and use them for our political purposes? It is, in my book, anti-Semitic to do so, and a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible is and who Jesus was. By the way, Jesus never once said a negative word about homosexuality. He did, however, in Matthew 19, say, some eunuchs were made that way by God. And twice in the Gospels, he turned to religious people who were religious bondage lawgivers and said, you know what? Sodom's going to have a better judgment day than you. So I would rethink whether Jesus is on board, the spirit of heaven is on board with the condemning way, hate-filled way, death-giving way that the evangelical church addresses Let me ask you same this. gender relationships. If you, and you've got another comment there from J.H. No, I will never watch a Vadi Bakum video ever again. <laughs> Nobody should ever watch. Vadi Bakum, excuse me, is he is the SBC version of I have a black friend. See, I'm not racist. I have a black friend. Don't ever. Let me no. warn everybody. Listen. Do not ever watch a Vadi Bakum video. It is horrifying. It is terrible. May God have mercy on that man's soul. If there is a God and there is a hell, may God have mercy on his soul. Never, okay. ever okay. watch a Vadi okay. Bakum video. Y'all all got Paul all fired up. <laughs> Yeah, all of our, so I think someone was messing with you to get you all riled up there. Anyway, I was going to ask you if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the way 
our contemporary society, our contemporary Western church society thinks, would this be the issue you would change? Like, what's the one thing you would you would change? Tell me the question again. What if you could wave a magic wand and the and do the renewing of the mind, transform the mind in the sort of the evangelical Western church? Yeah. What's like the one thing you'd want to pivot in the hearts and minds of the evangel- the collective evangelical church? I think the core of the problem with the evangelical church is we have all truth. Okay. We're the only, we're the only ones in yep. all of the history of the world yep. who have all truth. We have, despite the fact that Christianity has missed it so many times through its history, we are now in the one time in history in the one religious sect in all of history that has solved the riddle of what is all truth. Out of that belief system, which then feeds itself into biblical inerrancy, feeds itself into original sin and human depravity, and ultimately what it does is says, and then we get to be exclusive and otherize other people. When We get to marginalize other people, which is explicitly forbidden in the Bible. And I heard somebody the other day saying, if God endorses your exclusion of other people, like if God endorses your war, then there is no atrocity that is outside the realm of heavenly permissible. I can do anything to people if they are despised by God. I can commit genocide against people who are despised by God. I can pass laws against transgender children because they're despised by God and care nothing about their well-being. So yes, the one thing I would change is this idea that we have all truth and therefore we get to condemn others and we'll couch it in this go and sin no more language. That's what I would change. It's the opposite of Jesus. Yeah. It is. It looks nothing it like is. the person it is Jesus is that we read we read about in the yeah. Gospels. Yeah. In any way whatsoever. So JH says your opinion is more valuable than the Bible. No, my opinion is it is, is that formed by the Bible that, that is, your interpretation of the Bible is from a very indoctrinated, dogmatic, thinly defined sect. And I disagree with your interpretation of the Bible. And I think I have history. I have Jewish interpretation. I have the way Jesus treated people. I have a whole bunch of things backing me up. You have nothing but the fact that your sect continues to perpetuate it, no matter how many times you're told it's wrong, because you love to otherize and marginalize other people. See, when I don't know if you would agree with this, but when you're in a religious sect that tells you you're a dirty sinner just because you were born, because a guy ate a piece of fruit 6,000 years ago, you are a terrible being. There is nothing good that can come out of you. Your only hope is this guy died, was executed in a Roman execution 2,000 years ago. And that's the only thing that can keep God from smiting you then the only way you have to feel good about yourself is say, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than those people. I know I'm a terrible person. I'm I'm a shame-filled being. And thank God Jesus is protecting me from lightning bolts from God. But at least I'm better than those guys who are headed for hell. It is the opposite of Jesus who sat with the marginalized and was hated by religious people because he did it. Jesus was called a sinner because of the way he interacted with sinners. The religious people who looked a lot like evangelicals look today said, so we're right to assume you're a Samaritan and have a demon, right? Because you sit with Samaritans and people we consider demonic. I think what Christians can never do is take themselves out as the hero of the story. They can never look at the story of Jonah and say, oh, we're the ones rooting for God to wipe out those people. And God is saying, does that work for you? How is that working? And I think we need to start to say, do we look more like the religious whitewashed tombs than we do Jesus? Can we at least consider that for this? I season? think related to that, but I think the way I would express my my one, if I could wave the magic wand and change the religion that I grew up in and what I understood, what was said to me, like I wish that it I think it's the evangelical part of it. The like you have to convince somebody to think a certain way. And if you can, it's feeding into what you're saying. If they don't think a certain way, 
then they don't have value. They aren't loved by God. They're condemned, like all of these things. And what I am now realizing, and I'm 50, so I'm like <laughs> middle age, but what I'm now realizing, I know, I don't know why I say that I all the time. Like that middle aged. Okay. I think 50 is the new 25. Yeah. True. 27. I actually say it because I want people like, oh my God, that's so young. So it's like a reverse way to get <laughs> a compliment. You, you look so much younger than 50. That'll do as well. But anyway, I wish like it, it cuts you off from relationship and from connection with people and from genuinely loving each other. Because I literally would think to myself like, okay, I can be nice to this person, but I can't genuinely love and connect right. with them and have value for who they are it, because I have an agenda. I have to invite them to vacation Bible school. I have to get them into my church. I have to like, I have to have a sales quota. And it, it really, I cannot believe how much there's like this plexiglass over your heart and over your life when you are really in deep in this thinking that only certain people can experience God's love or have it right. And so I think that's what I would change. And I've definitely through my deconstructing journey, that's been part of I think what's been like really liberating and fun and exciting is to be like, I don't have to convert people. Right. Yay, I get to just believe I just get to know them. I get to love them. I get to be a part of affirming who God made that person to be and like, and cheer them on and connecting with God's love. That's like the coolest thing. By the way, our friend Rosie is on TikTok. Hi, Rosie. And our friend Dora is on Facebook. Dora, thank you guys for the gift today. Inside stuff here, but thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. The other thing I would change is the verse go and the little bit of a verse go and sin no more be taken out of the Bible. By the way, the story of the woman caught in adultery where Christians totally twist and abuse the statement go and sin no more from was never in any of the original gospels. It was not in any of the original manuscripts. It was added later on. Now, I think the story does demonstrate who Jesus is, but I love how Christians love go and sin no more. And forget that before Jesus said, go and sin no more. And by the way, I don't think in any way he was saying, stop sinning or you're going to get in trouble. But we can argue about that or not argue about that. But what Christians do obviously forget is before that go and sin no more comes up in the passage, Jesus puts his reputation on the line. He puts his job on the line. He puts his life on the line. He that, chases away that, every condemner that. of her. Yep turns to her and says, where are your condemners? And she said, you, you send them away. And then he says, and I do not condemn you. When he had every right under the law to do so. Yeah. And Christians just skip over that part. So let me tell you something, Christians. I'll give you that. If you risk your life for someone you consider a sinner, then I'll let you turn and say, hey, let's not come back here again. What do you say? But until you do that, you are absolutely abusing the go and sin no more part of that passage. And I really think Jesus was saying, by the way, you don't, you, you don't consider what you're doing sin anymore. I know you're doing the best you can under the very corrupt patriarchal system that we live under today. So I hate to put a pin in this, but do we've you? been going for an hour and... Some of us have to pay the bills. Some of us need to. <laughs> some of us need. I got to do the taxes. Tonight. And you got to do the taxes. I have to do meal prep for the week. Like life is happening. So, anyway, but we can keep going forever. Honestly, this has yeah. been such an amazing conversation, and I think it makes me want to come back here sooner rather than later, and not wait three <laughs> months like we did since this last time. But I do want to just say thank you so much for everybody who's been hanging out with us. Definitely check out Paul's website, pastor-paul.com and consider supporting. Be a subscriber. It's a low monthly fee. We are really putting our lives like this is this. We are committed to authentic, powerful, transformational love. And we are committed to that in our own lives and relationships and our own community. And we need support. Consider being a part of what we're building. And yeah. And can I say in the end of March this month, I have a new Reconstruction U cohort starting. This is my coaching service that I do. It is fantastic. It is an identity-based online curriculum with cohort learning, one-on-one -on -one get-togethers with me, 
an online curriculum, and it's a look at identity and transformation in life. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to an era or an age or an echo chamber, but be transformed by the never ending renewing of your mind so that you can know what is good and right in a season. And this is what we do is we look at who am I today? What am I believing about myself from the past that needs to go away? What am I, what mindset am I working from that needs to go away so that vision can come into my life and I find purpose into the next season of my life? And the testimonials, you can see some of them on my website. It's all right. I don't want to be overly proud. Yes, I do. It has been life changing for people. I am passionate about this. And yes, it's my occupation and how I make my living, but I do it because I could make a lot more money doing something else because I'm so excited to see people's lives actually changed. I pastored in a church for 10 years and it was wonderful and we did good things, but I never saw lives changed like I do see in coaching. It's the best pastoring I've ever done so far. So pastor-paul.com is the website. Yeah. And if you check that out and if you have questions about it, just email Paul and he's super good to set up a quick phone call or Zoom and answer any questions. It is your most intensive thing that you do. And so it can feel a little bit like, I don't know if I can take all that on, but there's different ways to, to work that through. So make sure just to reach out and say, hey, and let Paul know that you want to figure out how to be involved. All right, y'all. You guys are amazing. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for the sunglasses. Thank (laughs) you for the hard hands. Like TikTok has come up with some cool things in the last three months that that I got to see tonight. And um, And the Chinese now know what our house looks like. Well, that's for good God. We've been spied on by the Chinese government since you've been on can TikTok I, for a long time. Can I before can I just say we have a an Air National Guard base at our airport? Yeah, in Fresno, Fresno. on the West Coast. Yeah. And they are the what first line of defense well, for the la- coast. They're the last line, from what I'm told, the last line of defense for the West Coast. Oh, who's the we're, first? we're super inland. Like we're like the backup to the folk. So we're the protector, maybe is the oh, way to think of right? it. Okay. Yeah. They they told you on a tour before that occasionally Russian planes will fly into our airspace and they scream and they fly with them. And yeah. and they said, then we do the same to them. But we've just had a lot of planes taking off lately. So I'm just, I'm wondering if there are more Chinese balloons out there I don't know, but it's been loud because <laughs> we're like in the flight zone and it has been loud. So anyway, stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Love yourself and love somebody. Even tonight, before you go to bed, just take a minute to just appreciate who you are, who God has made you to be and just experience that embrace. And then also just take a quick look around and consider the amazing people who are in your life. And remember, God is not mad at you.